Okay, three, two, one. Oh my goodness. Good morning, good afternoon. Whatever it is for you, I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler. This is Strong Opinion Sports. Thank you so very much for tuning in. Today is Tuesday, March 5th. And uh, I'm really proud of today's episode. It's a really good one. I spent my entire weekend obsessed with Josh Rosen. And uh, I'm having a good day. It's it's a weird one. I just, uh, this room is the most challenging room I've ever recorded a podcast in. I moved to a new space recently. And uh, it's bizarre because I have no privacy. It's very weird for me. And uh, it's a hard place to record a show. Uh, But regardless, I want to say we have a great show lined up today. We're going to talk about Monday Night Football. I think Pat McAfee should be hired to be the new broadcaster replacing Jason Witten. We're going to talk about Combine Sensation receiver DK Metcalf. We'll talk about Bryce Harper's contract. We'll talk about Blake Griffin. There's a story about Blake Griffin that, for whatever reason, nobody seems to be talking about. And uh, please, before we start the show, I just want to say, remember, tell your friends about this podcast. Share it on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it is. Maybe screenshot it. You put it on your Instagram story. Uh, Help me grow by telling your friends about this show. So Josh Rosen. Josh Rosen has been all over the media recently. And this weekend, that caused me to develop an obsession. I watched every single game from Josh Rosen's rookie season. And my goal was to determine, is he any good? Does he suck? Should I believe in him? And what I ended up with was eight things that defined Josh Rosen's rookie season. And I was able to eventually determine whether or not I believe in him. So I want to say this. First, the number one thing that defined Josh Rosen's rookie season, not in order, not the most important, but the first thing I want to talk about is late throws. He was late often, all the time. And that's not entirely his fault. Like A lot of that is because he's a young quarterback learning a new offense and learning how to speed up the game. He just looked like he was processing things really slowly last year. He was really often late on timing throws, throws that require precise timing, hitch routes, Stop routes. On on a hit chart, you got to throw the ball before the receiver makes their break. And if a receiver is out of their break and waiting for the ball, then it's too late. And that happened a lot for Josh Rosen. He was throwing the ball late on timing routes, which allowed defenders to make plays on the ball. He also developed a habit out of nowhere. He didn't do this in college. Josh Rosen developed a habit of hitching unnecessarily. A hitch is where you have the ball in your hands and you step towards the line of scrimmage. You, you pause, you wait longer before you throw the football. A great example is a 10-yard out against the Broncos. It's a simple throw. I know for a fact because I played on the same field as Josh Rosen in, the, in high school at quarterback camps. Josh Rosen throws a 10-yard out really well. And I know he did this over and over and over again growing up. He could throw a 10-yard out in his sleep. But for whatever reason, I think he was either processing the defense or he just hesitated because he was nervous. Josh Rosen hitched up towards the ball, towards the receiver for no reason. And he was laid on the throw, which allowed a defender to make a play on the ball. It's not something typical of Josh Rosen. And there are two in particular throws I want to highlight. One was completed, one was not, but these are both egregiously late throws. The first one is on a levels concept against the Raiders. There are two medium crossers with a deep post behind it. A concept like this, you read it low to high, meaning that you run play action, which is a fake run, and the minute you flip around from play action, you get your eyes on the linebackers, the lowest part of the field. What are the linebackers doing? If they sucked up towards the line of scrimmage, there's probably a window to throw to the two shallow crossers, unless the safety steps up towards the line of scrimmage as well. You read it from the linebackers, then the safety, then find the post. So the linebackers bit a little bit on the play action fake, which normally would mean there's a window to throw the digs. However, the safety behind it stepped up towards the line of scrimmage, meaning there was nothing but green grass behind him. The post opened up right behind the safety. And Josh Rosen took a long, long time, for whatever reason, Josh Rosen took a long time to process this. Takes him too long to recognize, oh, the safety stepped up. I got to throw the post right behind the safety. He throws the ball really, really late. And I mean, he holds the ball for like six and a half seconds. One second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds. And by the time Josh Rosen eventually throws this football, it allows the backside safety 
to make a play on the ball. If he just let it go earlier, it's a huge completion, maybe even a touchdown. And multiple times, I saw Josh Rosen do this. He made the right read eventually, but it took him way too long to get there. And by the time he got there, he was late and he threw an incomplete pass because he allowed the defense to make a play on the ball. His process needs to speed up. Bang, bang, bang. Linebacker, safety, throw the football. There's a similar play against the Lions. It's a, it's a deep post, which clears out. And there is a dig. Larry Fitzgerald runs a dig underneath. So that there's a, a deep post, like a 40-yard post, which is supposed to get, make the safety get depth. And then underneath that comes Larry Fitzgerald across the middle of the field. The play side safety gets a bunch of depth. The play side safety takes away the post immediately. He bails to cover the post, which leaves the middle of the field wide open. Larry Fitzgerald is running all the way across the field with nobody, just a guy behind him, nothing but green grass. He's wide open. In NFL terms, this is wide open. And Josh Rosen simply takes way too long to get his eyes from the deep post onto Larry Fitzgerald. Eventually, he does the right thing. Eventually, he gets there. He completes the pass. He's fortunate. But the mental process needs to speed up for Josh Rosen. It's got to happen faster. The second thing, so that's, that's one thing. Josh Rosen was late all the time throwing the football. The second thing Josh Rosen did during his rookie year, and really the, the second thing that defines Josh Rosen's rookie season was that his offensive line was awful. Some of that's not Josh Rosen's fault. His offensive line was horrendous. He was sacked 45 times, 45 times Josh Rosen was sacked. That's 15 more sacks than every other rookie quarterback. Pro football focus ranked Josh Rosen's offensive line with the Cardinals the very worst in the NFL in 2018. I think it's really funny. If you compare Josh Rosen's rookie stats to other rookie quarterbacks from 2018, uh, he actually stacks up all right. Josh Rosen played 14 games, had 11 touchdowns, 14 interceptions, a 55% completion percentage, and 2,278 yards. Sam Darnold and Josh Rosen had similar numbers. Sam Darnold and Josh Allen and Josh Rosen all had similar numbers. They all had very, they're not that far apart. The Jets and the Bills are so confident they found their future franchise quarterback. Jets fans say, we have Sam Darnold, he's the man. Bills fans say, we have Josh Allen, he is the man. And the Cardinals, on the other hand, go, nah, our guy stinks. Sam Darnold had 17 touchdowns, 15 interceptions, a 57% completion percentage, 2,865 yards. Josh Allen, 12 games, 10 touchdowns, 12 interceptions, a 52% completion percentage, and 2,074 yards. It, they're split in hairs. There's about like a 600-yard difference between all of them in passing yards. They're both in the mid-50s for completion percentage, in the teens for touchdowns and interceptions. They're not that different. And yet, for whatever reason, Cardinals fans are bailing. They're ready to move on from Josh Rosen after just one year. It's very, very bizarre to me. It seems like Josh Rosen had a typical rookie year. And you'll see, there are six more things that defined Josh Rosen's rookie season in 2018. He certainly needs to get better. He's not a fantastic, amazing quarterback, but he's not far off from success. He's there. He's right there. He's so close. If you make a bunch of really small improvements, that's going to go a long way to help Josh Rosen attain success. It's also worth noting, his coaching staff did not do him any favors. The Cardinals' offensive coaching was atrocious. They had consistently bad play design, bad play calls. It's also, you got to mention, his offensive coordinator, Mike McCoy, was fired after just seven games. The, uh, the Cardinals' offensive coaching staff was a mess last year. They didn't help their players. They didn't set them up to succeed. And one of their guys got fired. Their offensive coordinator got fired. It's not good. And that leads me to the third thing that defines Josh Rosen's rookie season. It's bad play design. Right off the bat, there's a third and seven against the Falcons. The Falcons run cover one, which means that it's man coverage. Every receiver has a man covering them. And then there's a safety help deep over the safety deep over the top, helping to cover deep throws. And the Cardinals make the absolute worst play call given what the Falcons defense is running. The Falcons bring a five-man rush with man coverage behind it. And all four receivers and the running back for the Cardinals have a guy trailing or following them. And what do the, the Cardinals decide to do? Okay, we have they're playing man coverage. What do we do? The Cardinals run five, or sorry, the Cardinals run four hitch routes. 
if a guy is following you and you want to get away from him, the worst thing you can do is stop. And that's what the Cardinals did. The play call, four hitches is solid, I guess, if they're running zone coverage. You can settle in a window and get open. The problem is there's no window here. This is man coverage. There's no windows to settle in. Nobody's open because defenders can just sit and wait next to their receivers. Against man coverage, you want to run away from people. You want to have movement routes, guys running across the field. Put pressure on the defense. Multiple times there are serious errors in the Cardinals' offensive coaching last year and in play calls. It's it's terrible. Against the 49ers, the Cardinals have seven guys in to block a four-man rush, which means that the 49ers had seven defenders covering three wide receivers for the Cardinals. It's a terrible, terrible mismatch. You are not setting your players up to succeed. Look, Josh Rosen's failures as a rookie were not all the coach's fault. Rosen deserves some of the blame too, but certainly the coaching staff played a part in Josh Rosen's struggles as a rookie quarterback. That leads us to the fourth thing. Josh Rosen missed a lot of reads in 2018. He wasn't perfect. The first thing I want to highlight is a bootleg against the Lions. Josh Rosen's first read is wide open. It's a bootleg. He's running to the right, and the comeback immediately in front of his face. His very first read is wide open, and for whatever reason, Josh Rosen doesn't throw it. It's baffling. I don't understand. I mean, this is a play that, this is a concept that Josh Rosen has been running his whole life. Everybody runs a bootleg from peewee football to high school to college, now in the NFL. This should be bread and butter, easy money for Josh Rosen, and for whatever reason, he just doesn't see it. And as an NFL quarterback, you cannot simply just not see your first read wide open. This is a massive mistake by Josh Rosen. There's another concept against the Lions. The safety sits really deep over the top, and the corner sits way too long in a curl, which allows a corner route to come wide open for the Cardinals. And Josh Rosen, again, just doesn't see it. He's looking at that side of the field, but Josh Rosen didn't recognize the corner come wide open. He doesn't understand leverage. He tries to run away. It's not good. Again, Josh Rosen missed another read. Now, you got to also acknowledge the Lions had a three-man rush. A three-man rush should never get pressure that quickly. The Cardinals' offensive line was terrible. But the point is, Josh Rosen still has to recognize leverage. The guy is open. The corner comes open on the, le- on the bottom part of the screen if you're watching on YouTube, and you got to complete this pass. It's a mess. You can't have that. Next against the Falcons. Here's an example where Josh Rosen almost does the right thing. He's so close. He does a good job buying time. He extends the play, steps up in the pocket. And on the backside of this play, there is what we have called a, in high school, we called it a backside rail. It's like a comeback on the backside of the play. It's your fourth read. You go from one to two to three, all the way back to four. The problem is Josh Rosen doesn't work all the way across the field. He forces a ball laid over the middle and throws an interception. He doesn't go all the way through his read progression. He misses another read. Finally, we have the very most frustrating thing I saw on film. It's a very simple slant out concept. Everybody runs this again. This is a concept I guarantee Josh Rosen has been running since eighth grade football. It's a slant with an out. And I wanted to get into Josh Rosen's head. As a kid, uh, in high school, I I trained with the Elite 11 guys. They tell you on a slant out concept to read the number two man. And it's very possible that the minute Josh Rosen saw the safety, who's actually the number two man on this play, the minute he saw that guy break outside, he throws the ball inside to the slant. I'm, I'm trying to give Josh Rosen the benefit of the doubt here. I don't really understand what happened here, but maybe that's what happened. But there's a couple of problems with this. First of all, the outcome's wide open. Look at that flat route. It's wide open. And there is no chance the number two man, no matter how quickly he tries to get out there, there is no chance the outside, the number two man can get all the way outside to cover the flat. And and really the way this play works out is a slant works like a natural pick or a screen. Both defenders get caught up in the wash. And more than anything, this is not only a missed read. uh, I I think it's also just about reps and understanding. I don't think Josh Rosen understands the leverage here. The number two man, the guy he's been reading his whole life since high school, Eighth grade peewee football. That guy in the NFL simply just can't run that far to get all the way to the out. That might be what's happening. 
Larry Fitzgerald expected the ball, the guy running the out, Larry Fitzgerald. And Josh Rosen just needs reps. He needs to learn through trial and error. Every single one of these mistakes we're talking about from Josh Rosen is ultimately a lesson he can learn from. And that actually leads me to the fifth thing I want to talk about. The fifth thing that defined Josh Rosen's rookie season were tipped passes. It takes reps to understand how to deal with and how to avoid having passes tipped at the line of scrimmage. Here's, here's one against the Falcons. Josh Rosen has a tipped pass, get knocked up in the air, and go for a pick six. The play side defensive end jumps up and knocks the ball out of the air. There's a way to avoid this. It actually, there is a very logical, possible solution. We do this at my school. You can tag your protection. You can tell your play side tackle to go to the defensive end, the guy causing problems, and get hands on him. Make it harder for him to jump up. Some teams tag this, uh, like in high school, we called it a mom, a man on man. So you'd call your protection. Maybe it's uh, called lion. You'd go lion mom. So instead of saying normally you say lion, you go lion mom. That tells the play side tackle to go to the defensive end and not allow him to jump. Put your hands on him. That's one way you can engage the left tackle so the defensive end has a harder time jumping up and tipping the pass. That would have avoided this pick six against the Falcons. Another way to avoid a pick six is don't stare down the play side you're throwing to. If you're going to throw to the left, you know immediately you're going to throw the ball to the left side of the field. Take your eyes somewhere else. Don't telegraph where you're going with the football. If you stare it down the entire time, a defensive lineman is going to know, oh, he's throwing to the left, and that's what happened against the Broncos. There was another play picked, not tipped up, got picked off. That is what happened. Multiple times Josh Rosen went through this process. He didn't understand how to avoid getting passes tipped. He didn't know to do a man-on-man, -man, send the tackle to engage, and he just often stared down the side of the field he was throwing to. Another problem the Cardinals had last season was they simply could not win man-to-man -man matchups downfield. And defenses knew that. Defenses really took advantage of that. They only ran a four- or five-man rush the entire year, and uh, a lot of the time, teams that played the Cardinals backed off and played man coverage saying, you can't beat us throwing the football. And they couldn't. Either it was bad play design, there were drop passes, there were bad throws. For whatever reason, and that was six, by the way, for whatever reason, the Cardinals could not win one-on-one -on -one matchups downfield. The seventh thing that defined Josh Rosen in 2018 was a lack of mobility. A couple times, Josh Rosen was sacked because he simply could not escape the rush. He was trying to run. He wasn't fast enough. It's not in his skill set, and he got sacked. But even worse, there were times where defenses played to this. They knew that Josh Rosen wasn't going to run and knew that he couldn't run. So an example was the, uh, in third and four in the red zone, the Broncos rushed only four guys. They said, we're only going to ring a four-man rush. We're going to drop seven guys into coverage. And nobody's open. Four receivers and the running back, everybody has a guy on them. There's a deep safety in the middle of the field. And, and normally, a guy like Kyler Murray, Deshaun Watson, Josh Allen, a guy who can run, would recognize this and say, there's nobody covering me. They dropped everybody back. I'm going to run for the first down. Sadly, again, running simply isn't in Josh Rosen's repertoire. He, it's not a part of his skill set. And not being able to run really does limit Josh Rosen, especially the way the NFL is changing now. Uh, if Josh Rosen could run, he could do a lot more as a quarterback. Uh, and simply, he can't. And teams know this and play to it. Finally, the eighth thing that defined Josh Rosen during his rookie season was really good throws. We've talked about seven things that were really bad for Josh Rosen. He also, say what you want, when everything worked out properly, when Josh Rosen was on time, when the offensive line allowed him to hang in the pocket and read the defense properly. And when the coaching staff actually made a good play call, Josh Rosen had success. When everything works, Josh Rosen can play. He's not a horrible quarterback. Made some really good throws. I, I would not call Josh Rosen a lost cause. A lot of people are ready to give up on him. They're saying he's not good, doesn't have it. Small improvements would make a massive difference for this guy. I think he's actually really close to being a great quarterback. He just needs a little bit of help. He needs better coaching. He needs an offensive line. In 2018, the Cardinals lacked play calling. They lacked creativity with their play calling. Their coaching staff on offense was awful. They didn't take advantage of matchups. 
They didn't put Josh Rosen in a position to succeed. They didn't help him at all. Yes, he struggled during his rookie year, but it was no more than any rookie struggled in 2018. I don't know. On film, I saw a lot of ugly. I did. I saw a lot of really bad plays and plays I, I cringed at and said, ooh, that's not good. But I also saw a lot of promise. I don't think Josh Rosen is a horrible quarterback. In fact, I think he's got a lot of really good qualities. The way he plays, there's, there's hope. I believe in him. If he gets a good coaching staff and a good offensive line, Josh Rosen can succeed in the NFL. That's what I saw. I think he could be an outstanding NFL quarterback. He needs an offensive line. He needs better play calling. He needs offensive coaching that can help him. But if he gets the help he needs, Josh Rosen absolutely could be an outstanding NFL quarterback. So, uh, the rumor is that the Arizona Cardinals are considering trading their quarterback. They want to trade Josh Rosen and draft Kyler Murray with the number one overall pick in the NFL draft. Now, last year in the 2018 NFL draft, the Cardinals drafted Josh Rosen, quarterback from UCLA with the 10th overall pick. And then the Cardinals went 13 and went three and 13. Three wins, 13 losses. They fired their head coach, had the worst record in the NFL, and now they have the number one overall pick. Now in January, oh, things are looking up. The Cardinals hired Cliff Kingsbury to be their new head coach. And last year, in 2018, when Cliff Kingsbury was the head coach at Texas Tech University, right before he played Oklahoma, he was talking up Oklahoma's quarterback, Kyler Murray. He said that if he had the number one overall pick, he would draft Kyler Murray. Now, interestingly enough, he actually has the opportunity to do that. Believe it or not, months later, Cliff Kingsbury actually legitimately does have the number one overall pick. I don't know that he truly ever thought that would happen uh, when he gave that quote months ago, but... The rumors are, and it seems like it's getting more and more likely by the day, the rumors are the Cardinals are going to trade Josh Rosen and draft Kyler Murray. And it makes sense. It makes sense to me. Cliff Kingsbury, the Cardinals head coach, recruited Kyler Murray in high school. They recruited him out of Allen, Texas, when he was a head coach at Texas Tech. Cliff Kingsbury has wanted to work with Kyler Murray for years. Now he actually has the chance to work with the guy he's loved for so many years. Now, whether or not the Cardinals decide to move on from Josh Rosen and draft Kyler Murray, it really comes down to two things. Two things really are the deciding factors on whether or not the Cardinals decide to trade Josh Rosen and draft Kyler Murray. The number one thing is this. Do the Cardinals think that Kyler Murray is a generational talent? It doesn't matter what they think of Josh Rosen. If the Cardinals believe that Kyler Murray is a once-in-a-lifetime player. They should go after him. If they really feel that strongly about Kyler Murray, do it. You have all the power. You're never going to get a chance like this again. If you think he's the best player in years, do it. You have the power to do it. Make it happen. But frankly, I don't think Kyler Murray is held in that high of a regard. He's a great quarterback. He's not the best in 20 years. I don't think, I don't think he's that highly thought of. He's a great quarterback. He's not that great of a quarterback. Now, after watching film, I saw the Cardinals' current quarterback, Josh Rosen, he can play a little bit. He's not awful. You got to remember, with a horrible offensive line last year and with awful offensive coaching, he still had a solid year. He had over 2,000 yards passing, a 55% completion percentage. I think you got to look at it this way. Any success Josh Rosen had was a massive, massive accomplishment given how little he was allowed to work with. I mean, yeah, he struggled last year. He made some good throws. He made some bad throws. He had a lot of tip passes. He was really slow getting through his reads. But also, again, Josh Rosen had a terrible offensive line, terrible offensive coaching, and receivers that couldn't win one-on-one -on -one matchups. He's learned a lot. I think the, the lessons Josh Rosen has been through last year are going to help him in the future. As an NFL quarterback, he learned through trial and error. And the problems Josh Rosen had last year are going to help him long term. But here's the thing. Josh Rosen is not very mobile. He can't run. It's not in his skill set. And the Cardinals must decide how important is it for the Cardinals to have a quarterback with the ability to run? 
Do they want a guy who can run the football? Josh Rosen isn't awful. He's, I think he's close to success. Little, bit, little small tweaks are going to go a long way. He can get much better very quickly. But maybe here's the thing. Maybe Cliff Kingsbury decides. Maybe he says it's really important in my offense to have a quarterback who can run the football. That makes sense to me. I mean, Josh Rosen and Kyler Murray have a very similar ability to throw the football. But in comparison to Kyler Murray, Josh Rosen is really limited because he can't run. And Kyler Murray's ability to run the football really opens up the playbook. Your options are exponential if you have a running quarterback. And the Cardinals have a terrible offensive line. Some of those plays last year, Josh Rosen got sacked 45 times last year. Some of those plays are not sacks if Kyler Murray is the quarterback. He can run. He can escape pressure. He can get away from those bad plays. Those sacks could become really big, long runs for Kyler Murray. Now, if you want, if you want a reason, if you want a reason, this is why the Cardinals should trade Josh Rosen and draft Kyler Murray. They have a similar ability throwing the football. But Kyler Murray's ability, Kyler Murray's ability to run the football might make him too good to pass up. If you want a reason, that's the reason right there. Kyler Murray can run the football and Josh Rosen can't. That might be why the Cardinals should trade Josh Rosen and draft Kyler Murray. They have an offensive-minded head coach. I'm sure he would love to have a fun time designing an offense all around Kyler Murray's ability to run the football. He can run. He can throw. He's a great passer. He's a really good thrower of the football. He's got a great arm. He's, I think he has an underrated arm. Kyler Murray can do it all. And that might be it right there. If Cliff Kingsbury says, I want to work with Kyler Murray because he has more ability. The playbook is far more wide open. We can do more with Kyler Murray instead of Josh Rosen. That right there is the reason why the Cardinals should trade Josh Rosen and draft Kyler Murray. There are, there are swirling rumors right now. There are rumors all over the place. Arizona Cardinals quarterback Josh Rosen might be traded. And if he's traded, I believe a couple of teams should step up and make a move to get him. But first I want to say, there's something that really sits in my head. It's, it's interesting to me. We're all talking about whether or not Josh Rosen should be traded. And last year when he was drafted with a 10th overall pick, he was the fourth quarterback drafted. And he said after that draft, the three quarterbacks chosen ahead of him were all mistakes. And he was emotional. He was a little bit irrational. And he said something very brash, very egotistical. And I'm sure, and I really hope that the 2018 season, his rookie year, I hope that was humbling for Josh Rosen. Played in 14 games at a 55% completion percentage. 11 touchdowns to 14 interceptions, more interceptions than touchdowns. A little bit over 2,000 yards passing. His team went 3-13. and 13. His head coach was fired. I am sure that hurts Josh Rosen. I wonder what his ego is like right now. What is it like to be inside the head of Josh Rosen? Because that quote, the quarterbacks drafted ahead of me, there were three mistakes drafted ahead of me. With perspective, with my perspective, looking back on that, just strikes me as really selfish. A guy who's full of himself. And you got to remember, Josh Rosen has never, ever been a backup quarterback. He started as a true freshman in college. He played for three years from freshman, sophomore, junior year at UCLA. He was the man in high school. And if Josh Rosen's traded to a team like the Patriots or the Chargers or the Saints, does he have the maturity to be a backup? Like, legitimately, can Josh Rosen handle that? Can he put his team first? Can he prepare behind a guy like Drew Brees or Tom Brady? That's a real legitimate question. Because I think that too should trade for Josh Rosen. There are about eight teams that need a quarterback. The Saints, the Chargers, and the Patriots are the most interesting to me. Like the eight teams that need an NFL quarterback, the eight teams in the NFL that need a quarterback as soon as possible are the Chargers, the Patriots, the Saints, the Broncos, the Redskins, the Giants, the Jaguars, and the Dolphins. 
Now, I believe four quarterbacks are going to draft someone in the first round of the NFL draft. The Giants, the Broncos, the Redskins, and the Dolphins. I think they're all going to draft quarterbacks in the 2019 NFL draft. The Giants are likely to draft Dwayne Haskins. I really believe that. I think that it's, there's rumors. It sounds like the Broncos love Drew Locke, the quarterback from Missouri. It's the Giants, Dwayne Haskins, Broncos, Drew Locke. That means you're left with the Jaguars, the Redskins, and the Dolphins. Now, the Jaguars are rumored to sign Nick Foles, the quarterback from Philadelphia. And look, I, I would sign Nick Foles. I would still trade for Josh Rosen. I think Josh Rosen is a really good quarterback that could play soon. And I don't trust Nick Foles. I'm not a big, I like Nick Foles. He's a great guy. He's selfless. He would help Josh Rosen if needed be. But I, I don't trust Nick Foles long-term as my franchise quarterback. Sorry, I don't. And I know, I know that Josh Rosen's rookie year was tough. He was laid on a lot of throws. He didn't process defenses very quickly. He missed reads. There was also really bad play calling. He didn't get help. He had a bad offensive line. He didn't get a lot of help from his offensive coaching. His receivers couldn't win. He was sacked 45 times. He couldn't run last year. And in spite of all those struggles, Josh Rosen made some good throws. I think Josh Rosen is a solid quarterback that can play in the NFL. He can play. He's close to success. He needs a small tweaks. And he, with a little small adjustments, he can make a giant improvement and be a good NFL quarterback. And my top three quarterbacks in the NFL draft are Kyler Murray, Dwayne Haskins, and Drew Locke. And whatever team doesn't get one of those three guys, I, I, don't, I, I wouldn't risk it. If, you're, if your option is Josh Rosen or Drew Locke, who would you rather have? A guy with a year of NFL experience who is a far better prospect? Or, I said Drew Locke, I meant, I can't even get his name right, Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones is like the fourth guy in everybody's board. I'm not a fan of Daniel Jones. If for me it was Daniel Jones or Josh Rosen, I would much rather have Josh Rosen on my roster. That's the quarterback I'd want. And frankly, even if it's Drew Locke, I'd rather have Josh Rosen than Drew Locke. The only quarterbacks I wouldn't move, I, I would... I like Dwayne Haskins, and I like Kyler Murray. Otherwise, I would rather have Josh Rosen and a trade than any other quarterback. And if you need a quarterback right now, trade for Josh Rosen. Any team, the Giants, the Redskins, the Dolphins, the Jaguars, if you don't have a quarterback and you need one, trade for Josh Rosen because the rumor is he's cheap. You can trade like a third-round draft pick, and the Cardinals will give him to you. That's amazing. That's unbelievable. If you can get a franchise quarterback like Josh Rosen and also still keep your first-round pick and draft another guy who can be an impact player immediately and be a starter, that's huge. It's massive. Get a quarterback and another starter? What else can you ask for? But here are the three teams I really want to see trade for Josh Rosen. There's a lot of teams that don't have a quarterback that need one. The Dolphins, the Jaguars, the Redskins, the Giants, the Broncos. But the three teams that I think should absolutely make a move at Josh Rosen, if they haven't already, are the Patriots, the Chargers, and the Saints. The first thing I want to see, I want to see the Chargers go after Josh Rosen. Phillip Rivers, the Chargers quarterback, is getting old. Uh, and the Chargers must have a plan. They need to develop some kind of plan for when he retires. He really, his play fell off a cliff. He declined a lot at the end of the 2018 season. He was awful. And the Patriots against, that, against the, play, uh, the Patriots in the playoffs, Phillip Rivers was terrible. He's the reason why they lost. He looked old. It's also worth noting the Chargers are in Los Angeles, the city that Josh Rosen grew up in. That's huge. That's cool. Bring the hometown guy back. I'd love to see that. The second team I want to see trade for Josh Rosen is the New Orleans Saints. I know, I know Drew Brees was amazing last year. But he really slowed down towards the end. In the playoffs, end of the season, the Saints offense got more and more gimmicky as the year went on. They couldn't, Drew Brees' arm fell off a cliff. He couldn't throw the ball deep. They had to bring in backup Taysom Hill to throw deep balls. And the more time you have Taysom Hill on the field and the less time Drew Brees is on the field, the more it shows to me Ooh, they either don't believe in him, he can't do it, and they're getting more and more gimmicky. Like it or not, I love Drew Brees. He's one of my favorite quarterbacks. Fact, he's slowing down. 
And as the years go by, the Saints offense is going to get more and more gimmicky. They're going to rely more and more on their backup quarterback, Taysom Hill. The Saints need a backup plan behind Drew Brees, and Josh Rosen would be a perfect, perfect solution to eventually succeed Drew Brees. But here's the team I really want to see trade for Josh Rosen. It's the New England Patriots. It would be monumental. It would be awesome. Tom Brady's going to be 42 in August. Now, I know he, he's playing great. He looks really good. But how perfect would it be if the evil empire, the team that everybody is hating, everybody hates the Patriots, if the six-time Super Bowl champion New England Patriots traded for a former 10th overall pick quarterback Josh Rosen, it would be hilariously incredible. If somehow they got their hands on Josh Rosen, it's over. You, you know it would work. You know it would work. I know it would work because it's the Patriots. They always find a way. And how perfect. If they traded a third-round draft pick for a franchise quarterback and an opportunity to, keep, to stay relevant even after Tom Brady retires, it would be hilarious. I, I, I just, as a football fan, I want to see that happen. I would love that. If somehow they can do what I just, it would be unbelievable to get a franchise quarterback for that cheap a price, a third round draft pick. I would pay a second round draft pick for him. It would be awesome. And for Josh Rosen, the opportunity to sit and learn and get pissed off. I mean, if Josh Rosen isn't playing, he's not going to like it. But if he can learn and watch Tom Brady, I'm telling you, I know if Josh Rosen was traded to the Patriots, he would eventually be fantastic. So those are the teams I think should trade for Josh Rosen. Look, I think honestly, every team should. If you need a quarterback, you should trade for Josh Rosen. The Giants, the Redskins, the Jaguars, the Dolphins, the Patriots, the Steelers, the Chiefs, or whatever, the, the Chargers. If you need a quarterback, whether you need him now or in three years as a successor to your current quarterback, team should make a move at Josh Rosen. He can play. He's not off. I made a video about it. He's a good quarterback. And I would absolutely make a move at the Arizona Cardinals' current quarterback, Josh Rosen. If he's available, especially if he's going for like a third-round pick or a second-round pick, you would better make a move at Josh Rosen. Because I want to do a reminder. I'm going to take a break in a minute. My mouth is stressed. I'm tired. Uh, there's voices outside. I got to just take a break for a minute. But I want to say this first. I want your help. My dream is to do strong opinion sports full-time. It's my job. I mean, this is my favorite thing in the world. I love it. And if you believe in that dream, help me grow by telling your friends about this show. Share it on Facebook. Send a, share a link on Twitter. Maybe screenshot it, the show. Put it on Instagram. I want to do this myself. My dream is to own my own business and work for myself. I don't want to sell out and work for ESPN or CBS. And I don't have a marketing strategy. The way I don't have time. I'm a, an athlete in college. I have a full load of credits. I have also the podcast. I have a bunch going on. I don't have time, energy, or money to have a marketing strategy. People say, like, buy ad space all the time. I don't, I don't have the funds or the time to do that. My plan is to put all my effort into making the very best podcast I can. And if you believe in this show, if you, if you like it, if you believe in it, if you enjoy it, help me grow by telling your friends about the show. My name is Zach Schaumer. I'm going to take a short break. Uh, when I return, we'll talk about Bryce Harper. We'll talk about, oh, there's so much good stuff coming up. We'll talk about Bryce Harper. We'll talk about... Landon Collins, probably the best free agent in the NFL right now. And uh, there's a cool Blake Griffin story. Remember, so help me grow by telling your friends about the show. My name is Zach Schaumler. I will be right back. Okay, we are back. Uh, man, it's been a long day. Uh, we had a football. We had throwing at 6 in the morning today. I've been up since 5. I had a workout at 9. had an exam today. It's been a long, long day. And uh, it's just nice to be doing this. This is my favorite thing in the world is doing this show. And I want to talk about Bryce Harper. So 2015 National League MVP Bryce Harper has signed a deal with the Philadelphia Phillies. It's a 13-year deal worth $330 million. And I, I love, I love, I love this contract. This is the second big contract this offseason that's been signed in Major League Baseball. And uh, you know, earlier in the year, Manny Machado signed a 10-year deal worth $300 million with the San Diego Padres. I believe Bryce Harper's contract is way, way more interesting. Yeah, no criticism of Manny Machado. Like he's got a good gig. 
He chose warm weather in San Diego. He's going to play like every single day. I get it. I can't blame him. But the San Diego Padres are not on the hunt. It's not an interest. As a baseball fan, I don't care. Now, Bryce Harper chose the Phillies. The Phillies have a legitimate shot to make the playoffs in 2019. That is what I want to see. I like that. They're going to be in the highly competitive NL East division. I want to watch Bryce Harper, my favorite baseball player, have a chance to make the playoffs and be in a really competitive spot. The Phillies also added outfielder Andrew McCutcheon, another one of my favorite players. It's just weird to me. You know, Bryce Harper is my favorite player in baseball. He's the only player in baseball that draws me to the television. Andrew McCutcheon is very similar. I love him. I've loved him for years. He's 32 years old. He's a five-time All-Star, a, two, uh, a, one, a 2013 NL MVP, and a 2012 Golden Glove winner. What Andrew McCutcheon brings to the Phillies is veteran leadership. Andrew McCutcheon, they fixed their bullpen. The Phillies added Bryce Harper. The biggest question for the Phillies next year is their starting rotation, and it's just because they didn't add anything to it. They're the same rotation they had last year. They're fine. They're okay. They faded off towards the end of the year. Um, but here's why it gets really, really interesting to me. This is why Bryce Harper signing with the Phillies is so interesting. As much as the Philadelphia Phillies invested in Bryce Harper, Bryce Harper's also investing in Philadelphia. This 13-year contract won't expire until he's 39 years old. That tells us that Bryce Harper wants to spend the rest of his career in Philadelphia. Now, another thing worth noting is that Bryce Harper says he talked a lot with New Jersey native right around Philadelphia, Mike Trout. Mike Trout is a two-time MVP, a seven-time All-Star. He plays for the LA Angels. So apparently, according to Bryce Harper, Mike Trout and Bryce Harper were definitely in communications, talking about stuff and getting feedback from each other and sharing a lot before Bryce Harper decided to sign the 13-year deal with the Phillies. It's also worth noting, Mike Trout is from around Philadelphia. He's a huge Eagles fan. He's a huge 76ers fan. He's often at their games. You see him. There's a lot of pictures of him. I've seen it, I think on Sunday Night Football last year, we saw Mike Trout in the stands wearing an Eagles jersey. Mike Trout loves Philadelphia. And if they talked, so they talked before Bryce Harper signed the contract. And if Mike Trout loves Philadelphia, I hear that and go, man, I would be so disappointed if Mike Trout didn't eventually join Bryce Harper with the Philadelphia Phillies. 2021 is when Mike Trout can finally get there. That would be so, so cool. Mike Trout has two years left on his contract. In 2021, Mike Trout will be a free agent. If we can get both of those guys on the same team, I'm not a Phillies fan. I'm a baseball fan. As a baseball fan, that sounds just fantastic. I would love to see both of them on the same team. So the Bryce Harper contract, I really like it. I think it's a great move. Uh, I think people from Philadelphia must be happy. I mean, the Eagles are good right now. The 76ers have four really good stars, and the Phillies now have Bryce Harper. And Bryce Harper got everything he wanted. When you look at Manny Machado's contract, is fine, right? The Padres are awful, but he got a bunch of money. He lives in a good spot. Bryce Harper got everything. He got a long-term deal. He got a lot of money. And Bryce Harper has a chance to win games, to make the playoffs. I love it. I really love Bryce Harper joining the Philadelphia Phillies. It's a great move. It's exciting to me. And I, I want to see Bryce Harper in the hunt with a chance to win. I know we could have had that with the Nationals, but he wanted to be somewhere that could give him a ton of money and a long-term contract. Bryce Harper got everything he wanted. And I got to also note, at Bryce Harper's introductory press conference with the Phillies, he misspoke. Um, Bryce Harper said he wants to bring a championship to D.C., the wrong city. He lives in Philadelphia. He plays for Philadelphia, not Washington, D.C. It's, it's okay. Mistakes happen. The guy misspoke. I mean, you got to give, look, Bryce Harper, give him the benefit of the doubt. He played his entire career so far in Washington, D.C. I'm sure he's just used to saying, we got to bring a championship to D.C. But I, again, I just got to say, I love, I love this contract. I like it. He gets what he wants. He's going to chance to win. And I cannot wait to watch Bryce Harper play. For the Philadelphia Phillies. The New York Giants announced today that they are not going to franchise tag their safety, Landon Collins. What that means is Landon Collins is going to be a free agent effective basically immediately, middle of March. 
And if you don't know who Landon Collins is, you should know he is an incredible, fantastic football player. He's also only 25 years old. I actually didn't know that. He's been in so good for so long. I just assumed Landon Collins was like 30 years old, an NFL veteran. No, no, no. Landon Collins is 25 years old. He's only been in the NFL for four years. And three of the last four years, so the last three years in a row, Landon Collins has been a pro bowler. But even more than that, every single year that Landon Collins has been in the NFL, he has led the Giants in tackles. Even his rookie year, all four seasons, four years in a row, Landon Collins has been the Giants' leading tackler, and they're going to let him walk away. The reason why the Giants aren't re-signing Landon Collins is, well, first of all, it sounded like he wanted out. He cleared out his locker. He said, I'm, I'm not coming back. So he didn't want to be there. And the Giants said they don't want to pay him the money. They don't want to spend the money it would take to keep Landon Collins in New York. But this guy on the open market, Landon Collins, a free agent in the NFL, this is a massive, massive deal. He's really young. He's really talented. He's 25 years old. He has his whole career ahead of him. Landon Collins is the biggest, most interesting free agent right now in the NFL. And we're going to soon learn what Landon Collins wants from an NFL contract. Does he want money? Does he want to win? Maybe both? Could a team like Miami reach out and say, we have a bunch of sunshine, hang out on the beach? I don't know. I, I think the two things, the two teams that everyone's talking about right now are the Cowboys and the Seahawks. Everyone says the Cowboys and the Seahawks, they need a safety, and Landon Collins would fit well with their rosters. And sure, like maybe that, that's fine. The, the Cowboys have an opening. The Seahawks have an opening. Either one of those teams would be a good spot for Landon Collins. But if I was Landon Collins, I'd call my agent and say, hey, get the Indianapolis Colts on the phone. If I was Landon Collins, I would want to go to the Indianapolis Colts for three reasons. One, the Colts could use him, right? You could always use a great player like Landon Collins. He could play immediately. He could be a, an impact player for the Colts. But second, the Colts made the playoffs last year. They're in a position to win. They have a quarterback, a great head coach, a solid defense with a lot of young players. The Colts are ready to win right now. And third, the Colts have the most salary cap space available in the NFL. The Colts have a ton of money to spend. If you're Landon Collins, do you want to win games and get paid a ton of money? Because that's what the Indianapolis Colts could do for you. Plus, Indianapolis is cheap. Miami's nice, but Indianapolis is a way cheaper lifestyle. You can ball out for like half the price in Indianapolis. If I'm Landon Collins, I would want to go to the Indianapolis Colts. I know the rumors are the Seahawks or the Cowboys, but you get paid a ton of money. You get a chance to win. If I'm Landon Collins, I would absolutely reach out and I would want to join the Indianapolis Colts. <clears throat> Drink some water real quick. Maybe that's what happened earlier. Frankly, I just, you know, this first half of the podcast, I wasn't comfortable. It's so weird. I, I really, like, legitimately hate recording in this room. It's so hard. It's so freaking loud outside. I, you guys can't hear it. I've tuned the room so you can't hear anything going on. It's so weird and distracting to not have privacy and to hear conversations and doors slamming. And it's, it's no one's fault. It's just the building's a weird building. Um... It's really difficult to change the narrative about you. When there's a narrative about you and about who you are, uh, it's really hard to change that. Like, I cheated on a girl in high school. And, and by the way, that's stupid. That is bad. It's embarrassing. Don't do it. It's awful. Do not cheat on a girl or a guy. Just don't cheat on people. But after that, everyone labeled me as a cheater. I became the guy who cheats on girls. One time, one mistake was all it took. And my current girlfriend went to high school with me. She didn't know me, we weren't friends, but my girlfriend knew me as the guy who cheats on people. That was my reputation. And it, until she got to know me, she didn't realize I'm more than that. Now, Blake Griffin plays basketball for the Detroit Pistons. He's an NBA player. And Blake Griffin has a reputation for being a guy who can't shoot. 
He did a dunk over Ikea. I remember in the NBA All-Star game, it was a big deal. And ever since then, and really because of the way Blake Griffin started his career, because of what he did years ago, he established a reputation as a guy who scores inside, around the rim, who can dunk a lot, and can't really shoot. But Blake Griffin has evolved his game. He's changed. Blake Griffin is not the guy he once was. He's a much better, more well-rounded basketball player than he was early in his career. This is Blake Griffin's 10th season in the NBA. His first six seasons in the NBA, he shot less than one three-pointer a game. He didn't shoot three-pointers. It wasn't his game at all. He scored inside at a bunch of crazy dunks, and it worked really well. In each of his first five seasons in the NBA, Blake Griffin was named to the NBA All-Star Game. His style of play worked, and it worked really well. He had a lot of success. But then in his sixth season in the NFL, in the NBA, excuse me, during Blake Griffin's sixth season, he got hurt. He only played 35 games out of an 82-game season. Then in year seven, he got hurt again, played fewer games. Year eight, got hurt again. Year nine, got hurt, got traded, played fewer games. Now in year 10, Blake Griffin can no longer play with the same, same play style he did early in his career. And if you've been watching Blake Griffin very slowly over the last couple of years, he's made a change. He's developed. He's evolved. He's changed the way Blake Griffin plays basketball. Three seasons ago, Blake Griffin started shooting around five three-pointers a game. This season, for the first time in six years, Blake Griffin made it back to the All-Star game. He made it the first five years, had a, a five-year drought, a four-year drought, now he's back. Blake Griffin made it back to the NBA All-Star game. And he was voted in by the NBA coaches. He's not even a fan favorite. The coaches respected him and made him an all-star. But what's cool and what's interesting about Blake Griffin is he did it a different way. Blake Griffin made the all-star game playing a different style than he did early in his career. We're seeing a different Blake Griffin. He still scores inside, right? He still has cool dunks. He can still score around the rim. He's not just a pure shooter. like he, He's never been that. He's still a guy who scores inside. But early in Blake Griffin's career, the biggest criticism of him was the guy can't shoot at all. And now it simply isn't true. You can make that criticism. You can make the old, tired criticism of Blake Griffin say, the guy can't shoot. But it's not true. It's, it's just not true. And it's actually inspiring to see Blake Griffin, a guy who's changed the way he plays basketball. I would love to see Ben Simmons making an evolution the way that Blake Griffin has in his career. This year, Blake Griffin is shooting 6.8 three-pointers a game. Almost seven three-pointers a game. He's got a 36.6 field goal percentage from behind the arc. Tip of the cap, man. Blake Griffin is fantastic. It's interesting. It's cool. He changed the narrative about him, and he changed the way he plays basketball. His three-point percentage has improved, and now with the Detroit Pistons, Blake Griffin has a chance to make the playoffs for only the second time since 2009. That, to me, that's a cool story. It's a guy, Blake Griffin, who made a change, who completely changed the way he plays basketball and changed the narrative about him. A guy that couldn't shoot, now can shoot. And I think it's really cool. And it's fun to see a guy with the self-awareness to say, and not only self-awareness, he succeeded. Was an all-star, got hurt, couldn't get back, made it to the all-star game playing a very different way. That, Blake Griffin is a really cool story because of that. <clears throat> I need some water. Two topics left I want to talk about. This show, for whatever reason, today's episode is just going so long. I don't know if, I, I really think it's like paranoia. There's just noise outside and I'm not comfortable at all. I don't know. It's weird to me. It bothers me. I can't like check in right now. <clears throat> but regardless, I want to talk about DK Metcalf. I want to start with an analogy. My best friend's mom makes cookies all the time. It's her thing. She loves making cookies, and she makes fantastic cookies. And I've been around their house a lot. I've watched this process happen. I've watched her make cookies numerous times. And every time she puts the cookies in the oven, 
and goes back and checks on him from time to time. Periodically, she looks at him and checks on him. She touches him to make sure they're right. There's a moment when you're baking cookies where they look perfect. They look fantastic. On the outside, they're great. But if you pick one up, they just kind of melt and fall apart. And you'd realize, oh, the cookie isn't actually done. It's not fully developed. You got to let it cook for a little while longer. They look good at first, and then on upon inspection, you realize, oh, they're not ready. DK Metcalf is a wide receiver who's about to be drafted in the 2019 NFL Draft. He played at Ole Miss. He's a really interesting wide receiver prospect. And at the NFL Combine, he impressed a lot of people. He had a really good 40-timer and a 4-3-3-40, which is blazing fast. There's also a a viral photo of him where he just looks huge. He looks like a bodybuilder. Supposedly, DK Metcalf has 1.9% body fat. I mean, the guy looks shredded. He looks like a bodybuilder. He's massive. And he's 6'3", which means he's fast. He's tall. He looks like a bodybuilder. He looks the part. DK Metcalf looks great. And everybody's falling in love with DK Metcalf. They're saying that DK Metcalf might be a first-round pick. He's really good, and I I just don't buy it. I'm not sold on DK Metcalf at all. I think we need to slow down and really take a deep breath and completely analyze, is he actually a great prospect? Is he really the guy you want to be signing if you're an NFL team? Because I look at DK Metcalf, and I see a guy who got hurt in 2018. In 2018, DK Metcalf only played seven games. He hurt his neck and was out for the rest of the year. And that's not even the first time he's had a major injury cut one of his seasons short. Previously in 2016, DK Metcalf broke his foot in September and missed the entire year. Second game of the season, broke his foot, missed the rest of the season. Here's here's what's really concerning about DK Metcalf. In three seasons at Ole Miss, he only played 21 games. It's not great. And even more bizarre is he didn't exactly dominate when he was playing. In 2017, he played in 12 games and only had 39 catches. I say only. That's solid. That's not amazing. But that's, that's an okay year. That's not dominating. That's not the top of college football. And in 2018, he played seven games and had 26 catches. It's good. It's fine. About three and a half catches a game. I look at DK Metcalf and I go, nah, he's okay. He's, he's not bad. He's not awful. But he's not... I don't see Julio Jones or DeAndre Hopkins. I don't see DK Metcalf as a number one first-round pick, the top wide receiver, not only in the NFL draft, but not a number one wide receiver on an NFL team. I don't see it. I I just, I'm not with everybody else. And so I asked my buddy, my buddy Nathan Hawthorne. He's been on the show before. He played, he was a division one wide receiver. If you listen to the podcast regularly, you've heard him before. And so I asked Nathan, what do you think of DK Metcalf? He sent me his notes. He sent me a lot of thoughts. And basically, Nathan said that DK Metcalf gets away with really lazy and bad technique because he's so big, because he's six foot three, he's jacked, he can push people around, and it's not going to work in the NFL. His technique isn't up to snuff because he's gotten away with bad habits for years. He's also an average route runner. He's not crisp. He doesn't run in great, amazing routes like you need to see in the NFL. He's not great at catching in traffic when bodies are all around him. He doesn't catch, like on a slant with bodies around him, he doesn't catch it. Now, the one thing that DK Metcalf does really, really well, he's a really good vertical threat. You want a guy running deep down the field, running a streak? That's what you want him for. He can go up, he can jump over people and make catches. That is DK Metcalf's strength. He's a really good deep threat. But otherwise, he's an average wide receiver. He's not the first, he's not the first, he's not the guy I would draft as the first receiver drafted in a normal NFL draft. He's not Julio Jones. He's not DeAndre Hopkins. We're falling in love with a guy who's, frankly, nah, he's fine. Not amazing. And then my buddy Nathan used a term called stumbled quickness. I didn't know what that meant. I had to ask him. What that means is that DK Metcalf is quick, but he often rushes himself. He kind of stumbles out of the gate and loses his footing because he's in a hurry rather than being fluid and smooth. He ran a really bad shuttle time. He DK Metcalf is not a smooth, incredible athlete. He's a guy who's fast in one direction and really strong. That's not exactly what you want. 
And frankly, look at Jerry Rice or Antonio Brown. They're not the best athletes on the field. They have the best body control. They have the best hands. That's not what DK Metcalf has at all. So DK Metcalf is a freak of nature, right? He's a great athlete. He has a lot of potential. But potential is only valuable if you use it. And he certainly could develop into a great NFL wide receiver. But currently, that's simply not what DK Metcalf is. So I'm not sold on the guy. I know a lot of people are. I look at him and I see a project. He's not a polished wide receiver ready to play week one in the NFL. He's not going to have an impact week one. He's like those unbaked cookies in the oven. He's not ready. He looks good on the outside. He looks fantastic. And upon closer inspection, you realize, oh, DK Metcalf might look really good, but he's not ready. Okay, the final topic I want to talk about today, I know people outside are probably, probably dying. Um, there was a job opening in, uh, available on Monday Night Football. There was a job open there's a job open and available in the Monday Night Football booth. Jason Witten left ESPN. He rejoined the Dallas Cowboys and is playing in the NFL again. He's playing tight end for the Cowboys. It's great. It's also been reported that ESPN offered Peyton Manning the job of filling the Monday Night Football booth. And Peyton Manning declined. Peyton Manning said, nope, I'm good. I don't want it. So the question is, who should ESPN hire to jump into the Monday Night Football booth. Who should they replace Jason Witten with? And I know who I want. I've been saying this name for a long time. The guy I want to do Monday Night Football is former Colts punter Pat McAfee. He's brilliant, he's entertaining, and he wants the job. Here's what's really cool. When Pat McAfee retired from the NFL, he's top of his game, best punter in the NFL, he said, I'm done. I'm going to store my own company and do what he does now. He began podcasting. He began doing stand-up comedy. I mean, literally, you can look up, look it up, look up Pat McAfee stand-up comedy. He's got an hour set he did in Indianapolis of stand-up comedy. But even, even really what he does now, he's a content creator on, on the internet. He makes really funny, interesting videos. And using his platform, he's launched a campaign to grab ESPN's attention and kind of volley for the job on doing Monday Night Football. He's got the hashtag... Do the right thing, ESPN, and hashtag McAfee for Monday Night Football. And I think that's brilliant. I think it's awesome. I'm a big fan of Pat. If, if you've been following Pat McAfee, he did a broadcast for Fox last year. He did a, a Packers-Lions game, I think week 17 in the NFL season. And he killed it. I love, I love, I love Pat McAfee's style as a broadcaster. What he does is he blends his talent in stand-up comedy. He blends the entertaining side. He's an entertainer who also has a lot of analysis because he's a former NFL player and has insight into what an NFL locker room is like. I mean, normally sports broadcasters are really stuffy. They're boring. They're not interesting. And Pat McAfee's a kind of a balance of both. He's very, very interesting. I think really if Pat McAfee was hired to do Monday Night Football, he could change sports broadcasting forever because he could both be entertaining and informative. Like there's a spectrum, right? You don't want a guy all the way to one side who is crazy and loud and only trying to make jokes all the time. It's too much. That's too far to one side. But most sports broadcasters on the far opposite end of the spectrum where they're generic and really boring. Pat McAfee is a perfect middle ground. And because he's in the middle, he's different than normal because normal is really boring and generic. And that is why I hope Pat McAfee gets the job. He'd be interesting. I, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Jason Witten doing Monday Night Football. It wasn't good. I regularly muted my TV. It wasn't interesting. It wasn't fun for me. And if Pat did the broadcast for ESPN, it would be so, so good. It would be, it would be must, frankly, it'd be must-watch television. I would have to watch. I'd have to listen and be interested. And uh, I really think if he got on to ESPN, other people, because I don't think enough people know about him yet. If everyone knew who he was, he'd have the job already. But if Pat McAfee ever was hired to be the Monday Night Football broadcaster for ESPN, Instantly, he would go viral. There would be a lot of articles, be a lot of Twitter. In, like, there would be just a lot of noise about Pat McAfee, people going, oh my gosh, this is so good, it's so different, and it's so interesting. So my prediction is this, though. I don't think ESPN is going to do it. I wish they would. I don't think they're going to. I think, sadly, ESPN is too afraid of being different. 
and making a mistake. I don't think they're going to take a risk on a guy like Pat McAfee. But, man, I wish they would. Pat McAfee would be a fantastic, fantastic hire for Monday Night Football. That's who I want. And uh, I really hope it happens. It won't. I'm predicting that it won't. I'll be very sad. Uh, and really, it's going to be weird. Whoever they hire, if they don't hire Pat McAfee, it's going to be hard to listen to whoever they hire because I'm just going to be thinking, I wish it had been Pat. I, I'm trying not to think that way, but I think Pat McAfee would be an incredible, incredible job as the Monday Night Football broadcaster. That is who I want ESPN to hire to replace Jayden, Jason Witten on Monday Night Football. Guys, my name is Zach Schalmer. Thank you so much for listening. I'm going to end the show. And... Uh, I'll be back later this week, Thursday or Friday. Thank you so much for listening, and I will. Uh, I'll be back later the week. But I'm bum bam. We are done. My name is Zach Schaumler. This is my podcast, Strong Opinion Sports. It is my favorite thing in the entire world. And I, I want to. I want to ask for your help. I want this show to grow. I want more people to watch and more people to listen to this podcast. My dream is to do this show as my full time job. I want to own it myself. I want to do it on the internet and have complete control. I don't want to do it for CBS or ESPN. I don't want to work for a big network. I want to own it myself. And if you believe in that dream, please do me a huge favor. Help me grow by telling your friends about this podcast. Share it on Facebook. Share a link on Twitter. Maybe you screenshot it. Put it on Instagram. I, I, I don't have a marketing strategy beyond this. This is all I have. You know, A lot of people, one of the most common comments I get on YouTube is, you have great content. We love your stuff. You deserve more viewers. What you should do is you should buy ad spaces on Facebook or Twitter or promote yourself and buy, buy revenue, like buy ads. I have no money. I am a broke college kid. I, I can't buy ad spaces. I, 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 don't have, I don't have money to pay for books. And so my plan, this is my marketing plan. This is my strategy. All I plan to do is put every ounce of effort I have into making the very best podcast I can. I believe if I make a great product that people believe in, that people like, then they will share it with their friends. And so if you agree with that, if you believe in this show, if you like what I do, please do me a huge favor. Tell your friends about it. Help me grow by telling your friends about this podcast.